So welcome everybody to today's Open Door show from Property CEO. Now, my name's Colin Smith, and it's a great to have you with us today. And over the next 20 minutes or so, we'll be taking a bit of a deep dive into the world of small scale property development. Now, when we talk about small scale, what we actually mean is that we're converting uh, commercial buildings such as offices, shops and light industrial units into residential flats. And it could be as simple as converting a small scale uh, office building or the upstairs storage area of a shop, something like that. Now, if you'd like to know a little bit more about that, then we have a link uh, below in the description there. OK, now, as always, we'll be talking to some of the movers and the shakers out there who can give us the inside track on what's happening in the world of property. And we'll also be shining a bit of a spotlight on any areas that we think would be good for opportunity for new developers to take a look at. And obviously sharing some vital information as well. So what have we got on today's show? Well, my special guest today is Dan Stiles. Hi, Dan. Hi, uh, Dan Stiles is project manager and consultant quantity surveyor at Syndicate Property Development. He works very closely with us at Property CEO, and uh, his uh, details will be in the description below. OK, so we're going to kick it off today. Hi, Dan. Nice to have you on the show today. Um, Thanks for having me. So you're a project manager. All right. Now, for those of you that don't know, can you just explain exactly what a project manager actually does? So in the context of what we do at Property CEO, and I think that's an important place to start, is to make sure that we are representing you as the CEO and we're delivering the projects under the parameters of which you set out to deliver. Importantly, we are your eyes and ears. We are the buffer between you and your technical team and your contractor. It's a very important relationship. So you keep a, a linear chain between that uh, platform. Um, so they, you circumnavigate the, the risk of a triangulation where you create multiple links in there. So it's a project manager on property CEO is an important role um, because we are there to support you as a student in delivering those projects using permitted development rights. As as you say, it could be doing shops with uppers or light mm. by industrial or warehouse, um, something that can be easily converted using those rights. And the, the project manager is going to sit there and make sure that all those parties are doing what they're supposed to be doing at the right time. Very important role. They will have a good understanding of the construction, the, the methods of construction. They'll understand what it involves those individuals and understand in, in those disciplines what they're going to do. So whilst we may not be an architect, we'll understand what the architect's trying to do, similarly with a structural engineer and so on and so forth. So it's understanding those worlds understanding those processes and making sure that they're all coming together in a cohesive way that helps to deliver what you want. So it's a very important relationship and your your engagement is straight with your project manager. So as a, as a CEO and your project manager, that's just a tight knit. So you're going to work very, very closely together. And um, it's a very important that the information is passed down to your project manager to ensure that they can deliver what you perceive you want to deliver. Um, and if there's questions to be asked, they will ask them on your behalf and they will be your your buffer, your shield um, in that process. Sounds First. very much like your project manager is like the number one person in your team, like the, the, the key yeah. spokesman for you as, as the clients. They very much so. They, <clears throat> they, um, they are the hub uh, of it. And, um, and like I say, it's a, it's a linear uh, relationship between the CEO and the project manager, um, and then then it cascades out from that. But they are, you know, the, the main part of the team mm. in the sense of the delivering side. Now, everybody else has an important role in it, but they are the centre of it, and they're making sure that everything mm. is going uh, into it's plan. It's almost like 
almost like they're a CEO in their own right, really, taking control. Almost. The They've almost become the virtual CEO, don't they, in that yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah, that, that's an interesting thing. But the thing is, you know, I've got a little bit of experience with development, you know, and maybe I, I've, I've put a kitchen extension on my house or something like that. Um, you know, why shouldn't I manage my own development project myself? Can you give me reasons why I shouldn't do that? Well, there's often a appreciation that actually yeah, i can do this myself what well, it's not that difficult i've seen many tv shows and they can do it i can do it but what they fail to realize is the complexities of that and i think that's the reality is the complexities are relating to processes and it's all about timing often it's about understanding and how you overcome problems and it's not just the ones that you see now, it's looking down the line, looking to the future and trying to circumnavigate potential pitfalls. And that's where your project manager will come into it. Whereas, whereas you're imagining it yourself, you're going to be more reactive rather than proactive. And that is one of the fundamental flaws of an inexperienced person taking on themselves, say, I can do this. I've seen other people do it. But the reality is when you come to do it, it's like you're starting to sort of learn to swim when you've just fallen off the boat. <laughs> um, you 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 need to find the, the 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 shallows very quickly. And so, if you're if you're not and you're just floundering around, you're you're causing chaos, you're causing confusion, and you're going to upset that process. And inevitably, that's going to cost you time and money. Yeah. Um, and quality all of those factors will be affected by those processes so you don't want that problem you want to pass that buck down the line and say mr project manager mrs project manager please yeah. deliver this on my behalf i don't want this stress thank you yeah it's a bit like you know well i can lay a few bricks why don't i just build it myself in actual fact as i often use the phrase it's horses for courses and you should really just use the expert, shouldn't you? You know, and yeah. let, let them do the job that they're and their expertise in it. Now, one of the things that were some of the scare stories that I've heard about development sites, building sites, that sort of thing, is this thing called health and safety. Now, you know, I've heard them that they can be rather like the uh, construction industry's police force sort of thing, you know, that sort of thing. I do understand that they're a very serious part of development, but do you, or do you, or can you handle that side of things as well? So uh, there is uh, there is legal responsibilities um, that the employer as the CEO has under CDM. So there, <clears throat> the new role of the principal designer and how they integrate into the, the process is all about safeguarding the project. And therefore, the emphasis is on prevention rather than a cure. So <clears throat> you're, you're, you're trying to foresee what's down the line making sure you design out those risks and and therefore absolving yourself of the liabilities because ultimately you are the person engaging in this project. Without that project, there wouldn't be any of this to start from. Mm. So you have to understand your responsibilities. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a clear role that you have to take on board. And, you know, the detail of that, we could get into a, a whole another show but the the reality is there is um legal requirements to to overcome in any construction project now so so the the client if you like the ceo is has the ultimate responsibility for for the project but they yep. they can effectively uh they can delegate that responsibility a bit by employing yep. the, the professionals and so on and, and that's that again just shows you what a vital part the old uh, prom uh, uh, the project manager actually has uh, with, with the project itself. Yeah. And I have to be honest, I didn't quite realise that. So the client has ultimate responsibility, but you can delegate that responsibility. Yeah, so so okay. if you fail to do that, then you will take that by default upon yourself to to um, fulfil that obligation under, under legal requirements. So it's not a case of, I didn't know, I didn't do anything. 
you can't hide behind that now you yeah. have to and it's very important that if you're engaging with an architect that they point those out to you you're in, you're in thing oh your project manager point those what those processes are that you need to do but you're absolutely right you can delegate that to a person a, a, this professional and anybody can become that you've just got to have the expertise and knowledge of what to, and understand what their legal requirements are mm. so um Ultimately, yes, you want to engage with somebody yeah. on that. Engage the correct professionals as always. That seems to be the main message today. Get the right professionals on board. Yeah. There's something else that I often think about as well as costs on a project. You often hear about, especially these are TV programs, how costs overrun because, you know, maybe the project isn't being run correctly. That's why you need the project manager. But they tend to over uh, overrun because you see the client, especially on these TV programs, they seem to be negotiating extras and variations and changes directly with the contractor. Now, I'm yep. presuming that the project manager is there to stop the client doing that? Absolutely. So it goes back to the triangle that I was saying there. So a, a contractor will tend to try and bypass that that intermediary because they feel that they, by getting to where the, the, the monies are coming from, they have the ultimate paycheck, that that's a better way place for them. And it's very easy to be drawn in as the, as the employer because they may be really friendly, open people, yeah. um, but they're doing it for one reason, and that's to protect their bank balance. Um, so they're just looking after themselves. Um, and the problem is you're vulnerable and you may not be skilled in answering the questions and you're being led down a path that you feel is the right decision and you've not taken the advice of your professional team. It's very important that that relationship stays in that linear line yeah. the contractor speaks to the project manager and the project manager speaks to the client the decisions are made upstream and it might be that the project manager would advise the best route or give alternative solutions or work with other individuals in the team to come up with a mm. solution to a problem and then present that back to the client for ultimate sign off yeah. and, but that is presented to the contractor through that channel um if you decide upon your thing, you think, well, I can do this myself and, you know, it's only another £5,000 on something or other. Yeah. It keeps going and keeps going. And all of a sudden you've lost control of your budget. So you want to avoid that at all times to try and take those. Once you're dealing with the contractor one-on-one, -on -one, it's, it's, you know, gloves are off, let's say. <laughs> but once again, it's vital to have the, your project manager absolutely on your side, and he's he's the go-to guy between between yourself and everybody else. Yeah, it's, and it's just reinforcing that. It's you know, if that opportunity comes, you know, it might be that you've visited his site and the contractor turns up and says, you know, sort of pulls you to one side and starts talking in your ear. You make it very clear. That's fine, but you need to speak to my project manager. They will tell you what to do. Right. Um, importantly, is having that relationship with your client. So if there is things that they want to change or they don't like, they take that offline. You speak with it in an, in, in a, in a, an environment that's not in the ears of the contractor. You, you chew it over, you make your decision, and then you pass that information. It sounds so simple, but so often that chain of communication gets broken yeah. and once it's broken it's very difficult to fix it and I, and I suppose the thing that enforces everything is the contract uh yeah. and I, I can see therefore that it's absolutely vital that you always have a contract don't rely on a you know my, the builder's my best friend and we had a good handshake and a pint down the pub and it's all, everything's dandy but in truth we actually need a very very good contract so again is that something that you would organise the, the contract? So absolutely, it's so often that it's a you know a handshake deal, like you say. Um, I thought you know we, I knew what they were doing, and they turned out not to do what they were supposed to be doing at all. Um, so there is suites of contract, and you know, the one we would tend to use on these type of projects is a JCT form of contract, probably a traditional form without design and build in it. What does JCT um, stand for? Sorry, Dan. Joint Contracts Tribunal. Okay, thank you. So um, 
they will they've got a whole suite of contracts for all different scenarios um and sometimes a funder will guide um the the what they would prefer you to use sometimes other times it would be using uh, the experience the complexities of what's going on so there's there's kind of a almost a checklist you can fill out based on what you want and it will give you the best scenario of contract to use mm -hmm. um you, you really don't want to get into major adjustments of contracts because they've tried and tested if you start adjusting contracts then you can cause all sorts of problems with clauses within that but ultimately it's there to safeguard it's to be an unbiased platform that protects the parties to say well this is what you want and this is how we're going to do it mm. um it's there you know to safeguard it all it's not there to be a instrument of torture <laughs> <laughs> a big stick and to beat them a with. big stick <laughs> it's there to be unbiased in that way it's you know you will do this work and you will get paid for doing it mm. um when things don't go quite to plan obviously that's what you fall back to use that position and there's mechanisms in there of how you deal with certain scenarios right. um but very important that a contract is drawn up if your contractor is resilient to that mm. walk away okay all right well this sounds very potentially quite expensive i mean you're, you're doing a lot of things here and uh i'm sure that you're you're earning your money um but uh you know I, i'm presuming that uh the cost of your professionals and that means you as well is all covered within the development finance it's not necessarily coming directly out of the client's pocket so to speak can you just quickly give you a rough idea what what our project management fees what what, what we're likely to expect so in in the projects that we tend to see through the property ceo community they're they're probably more of the starter end of the the development world so you're probably looking at units six eight ten twelve yes. fourteen size um so based around those more smaller scales it, you tend to have a percentage of probably ranging between three and five percent for your project manager in there depending on the complexities depending on what uh what they're going to be doing on your behalf mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing um often i say always once you know what you're doing go and get a quotation from from your project manager for them mm -hmm. and understand what they're offering in return for their services um if it's on a ad hoc charge rate on an hourly or a daily rate it's very difficult to establish how much is that going to cost you mm -hmm. um, it's almost an open-ended checkbook so really you want you want to know the full picture and if they're if they're resilient to giving you a quotation then there must be reasons for it is that they don't have confidence in what you're asking them to do or there's a lack of information in because reality is that they should be able to give you a fee for doing this work um and if there's not what's missing and then what can you put in place to make sure that is there so that's the kind of range that we would typically do um and then it's tailored specifically to the the needs of the the project right um, but so the construction uh sorry the, the the pm fee your project management fee is based on the construction fees uh, yeah we, we we would look at the build cost build cost based, yeah and we'll work our fees around that there's more things that come into play so we look at you know what we're trying to convert mm. the complexities of that project um and that will de determine how much resource and time is going to take on that but when you consider just you know every aspect that you're actually involved with and you're in, in effect you're protecting the client looking after contracts looking after self and hate health and safety difficult to say that mm -hmm. and also you're li liaising probably very regularly with uh, the contractor and protecting the client yet again all in all that percentage is, is not a lot of money is it when you consider not really the, yeah you consider the value of the site and you know weigh that up against your potential profits at the end of this of the scheme is money well spent probably yeah um, so to enable you to do all of this do you have to be on site every day we wouldn't necessarily need to be on site every day um you would be in contact with your your construction team whether it's your technical team or your contractor uh, on a regular basis it's as needed as required um yes regular site visits are very important um it's about confidence it's about 
that building that relationship if, if the contractor's performing and they're giving good feedback and the you know when you're going to say it and it's all going well then that builds that confidence if 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 you're seeing that the project's not got that kind of momentum then it might be that you have to provide more time it's it's looking at the competence of that contractor in the first instance are they the right fit for the development do they have the right um, depth of organization the right skill sets etc can they fund it can they cash flow it um it's all about doing your due diligence on them in the first instance and then building that relationship along there that's, that's, you know, that's very interesting isn't it because you, you actually hit something there which a lot of uh, uh, would-be developers think about and that is hang on a second that the contractors actually ask for money up front to get the building started yeah. And that's not the way to go, is it? This is not your one man in a van outfit. This is a proper contractual uh, business. And they should have the means to fund the first part of, of the build themselves. Yeah. I mean, sometimes there is, you know, mitigating circumstances where certain specialisms are needed to be paid up front because they're long lead times or specialist design items. And it could be that you pay that in advance to that supplier if that's it um it's just really identifying the risk items but on general the properties that we're trying to see and in, in the property ceo fraternity mm. i wouldn't expect that to be a requirement the contractors should be able to run these projects and manage them right um, okay. and cash flow them yeah like i say you're taking on a lot of responsibility there that's uh, very mm. interesting but you know oh, at the end of the day how do I know that I've got the right project manager for the job? What do I look for? How, how do I almost, how do I vet them? So I think it's important that you look at their background, their experience, um, look for what they've worked on that has relevance to what you're looking to do and where you want to go. If you are, if you're building a certain brand, do they have that skill set to deliver your brand and look at their performance and, um, Go visit the projects perhaps that they've worked on. If, they, if they're able to go back and see a property and say, look, you know, they worked on this. This is a similar type of project. This is, get that feedback. Maybe if they've worked with other people, will they give those as references? It's all about building that rapport with that project manager. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's two-way. That project manager's got to work with you. Mm. So if they don't, if you don't connect and you don't bond, this relationship's going to be very fractured from the start. So, yeah. you know, I, I always say you're going to be in bed with that person for, let's say, two years. You're going to be working very, very closely together. You've got to be able to work with each other. And that comes down to human, um, you know, habits and, and personalities. Um, they might have everything, all the credentials, but if you can't get on with that individual, yeah. It's not going to work. It's per, you know, it's just building that relationship. It is um, a very, very true saying, isn't it? That property is all about people. It's absolutely. all about personal relationships and so on. So very, very important that you can get on with your PM. As you say, you're going to be almost living with them for 18 months, two years on your small project. So, yeah, yeah. absolutely vital that you get on well with them. Well, we're, we're quickly running out of time for this particular session. Um, now, Dan, how can our viewers actually contact you uh, if they need more information about your services? Uh, can you just tell us at your company and so on, your contact details? So, yeah, so we're called Syndicate Property Development. Uh, you can get, find us on our website, www.syndicatepropertydevelopment.co.uk. Um, if you go there, you can see a portfolio of projects we've done. You've got a contact us uh, page on there. Drop us a line through that. It's got a telephone numbers and everything on there. It tells you where we are. Um, we work all over the country. So, um, yeah, reach out to us and I'm sure we can help you along your journey. Yeah, that's very important that basically you're not in, in, in any particular location. You can cover most of England within reason <laughs> within reason yeah but reason. um yeah we, we you know we, we've we've been working with the property ceo for five six years now so yes. yeah we understand what we do here yeah exactly and we will put your contact details in the description below as thank well you. well dan thank you very much for joining us today that's, that's been right. really, really good and uh, i would just like to say one last thing here now if you would like to know a little bit more about property ceo and what we do there um they do offer a free half day workshop it's called the six figure roadmap 
And you can email us at support at propertyceo.co.uk. And there's also another link. Again, it will be in the description as well. And it's propertyceo.co.uk forward slash SFR, which stands for Six Figure Roadmap. There you go. Well, thanks very much again, Dan. It's been great to chat with you. And uh, no doubt we'll be uh, meeting up again very, very soon. Cheers for now. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.